All right, it's April 5th, uh, and I'm once again with John Wentworth, Alpha Company, 2nd Battalion of the 5th Cav, radio operator from 68 to 69. Now, John, when you would go out on patrol and as a RTO, what kind of information would you relay to the platoon sergeant and the platoon commander when you're out on patrol over that comes over the radio? There are two kinds of RTOs, one faced upwards, And, and one face downwards, and then different frequencies were used. So if I was a platoon sergeant RTO, I would pretty much only receive communications. But if I if I initiated communications, it'd be going up to the platoon leaders RTO, and they would just just stop, go, turn left, turn right, watch out for this, look out for that. And then the platoon leader would talk to the platoon sergeant and through through the RTOs, and then would also talk upward to the uh, CO's RTO. The CO's RTO, the CO had two RTOs. One would talk downward to the platoon leaders, and one would talk up to the battalion. So it was just operational information. Well, and through that, I think this leads perfectly into the follow-up question. Would all of the platoons of Alpha Company be on the same frequency, and would the battalion be on a different frequency from the companies? Yes, I can no longer tell you the detail because too many years have gone by. But, but certainly the uh, battalion... Wants to wants to communicate with the CO. Doesn't want to communicate with the platoon leaders or platoon sergeants. So they're on their own. They're on the battalion frequency. Well, and through that too. I mean, outside of monitoring, of course, the radio, any information that's coming through, you're also still carrying a combat load, correct? I didn't. Let's see. But then I, I didn't. I carried a radio and spare battery, some smokes. I happened to be the demolition guy, so I carried four or five sticks of one pound sticks of C4. I carried two bandoliers of M16 ammo, and I did not carry the the, the ropes of machine gun ammo. I was already carrying 65 pounds. That's a lot of weight, especially when you're humping up and down ever-changing terrain, correct? And 100 degrees temperature. Yeah. Now, how many canteens? I I sweat more than most people, so I most people would carry two. I carried four. And with the, with the canteens, I know... Some guys would put Kool-Aid packets in their canteens. Would you do any of that or just straight water? Just water but, and then and anti-malaria pills, anti-dysentery pills. And then as we're on patrol you, and you're moving from checkpoint to checkpoint in itself, that radio starts to get pretty heavy, if I'm not mistaken, the Prick 25, correct? I was young. <laughs> I was young and I was strong. Now, in a patrol with the platoon, where would you walk as the radio man? Would you be in the rear or in the middle? I'd, I'd be heard next next to whoever's radio I was carrying. So if I was, a, except for one time when a, some sergeant got mad at me and took away my radio and made me walk point for a week. <laughs> and then I walked point for a week. Well, if I may ask, he, he got over it. What was it like walking point for that week? My 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 default emotion to this day is rage. So I was just in a state of perpetual rage for a week and looking for a fight. Well, 
Well, through that too, I mean, walking point for this week and that mindset, were there any firefights or skirmishes that were in, that happened when you were on point? No, blessedly not. And so we were, we were in the woods. We were we were prowling around the Ho Chi Minh Trail. We did a lot of walking and a lot of looking for people to get in fights with and very, very few combat. We we didn't we didn't get into into conflicts except on the rice paddies. And then in, in the in the woods down in three core and then then we had in the woods in three core we had one experience where we lost six guys. And that was the, the week before Thanksgiving, 68. And then in the middle of December, we went and attacked what turned out to be the, the largest divisional forward supply, NBA divisional forward supply base in, in the country and took it away from the NBA. And that's a fight that lasted three and a half days. We lost 35% of our guys. And then we got done offloading all the all the, the bounty and decided to walk out and got in another fight and lost a couple more people. But when well, we were walking around the woods, we just we were hunting and not having real good luck. Well, and in the woods in itself, would would you find any booby traps, especially along the Ho Chi Minh Trail or any evidence of NVA movement? No, we found booby traps down in in the hills. One of the guys tripped a, a, a piece of fish line that was attached to a Chicom grenade and lost his eyesight. But that was down on the rice paddies. The Ho Chi Minh Trail was a, a series of many trails covering an entire mountain range. And, and so the chances of running into somebody or that somebody leaving a booby trap for us was not great. We found stairways. We found we found um, copper com wire. So they had telephones. We we left some booby traps, but they they but we didn't run into any of their booby traps. Well, and what kind of booby traps would you leave behind in itself as American forces? We we found some recently occupied bunkers. On the, on the side of a, of a mountain in the middle of absolutely nowhere. And we, uh, there's, there's two kinds of tear gas. One is gas and the other is particles. And we had some of the, we got some of the particle based tear gas and fired it off inside these bunkers. And what would happen would be we, we'd go away and, and the particles would be stuck to the ceiling. And someone later on, we would hope, would come in and they would disturb the air and the particles would fall down and give them ice ore. And we also would leave, when we were down on the flats, we would leave sea ration cans with the tiniest little hole poked in them. So they would go bad and hopefully they wouldn't notice, the bad guys wouldn't notice and would eat the food, not being familiar with it, having a, a Western palate they maybe couldn't tell. And then they get diarrhea, which, you know, one person in a, in a group of soldiers that gets diarrhea slows down the whole group of soldiers. Those are the two things that we did. Well, I mean, tactically, it's, pretty brilliant to try to utilize that against the Viet Cong, especially with the sea rations or the, even the NVA, knowing that oftentimes they would investigate and take what was left behind and utilize them in further traps. I mean, it's pretty soundproof, if you ask my opinion. First Cav was a very good organization to be part of. They had good soldiers and good tacticians and good strategists and um, we we did some stupid things, but we did a lot of smart things. Well, and even through that too, I mean, um, when I think about even the aspect of booby trapping, you are the outside of recon and talking to some SOG guys, you're the first regular grunt that's mentioned what little tactics you would try to do against the enemy when you came across 
undiscovered areas or their bunkers. I mean, it's interesting. We we were good. We were we were picked to be the poster kids for the Vietnam War in uh, for Thanksgiving '68. So we were recognized as as being the, one of the best infantry companies in the country. Wow. I mean, that's got to be one hell of a high honor to have. I, yeah, I, I personally I struggle with that a little bit, but but I'm certainly proud of being in the cabin. I'm certainly proud of being in A25. We, we were very good at what we did. We had, we had two company commanders. One was good, and the other was great. And it ended up with a distinguished service cross for his trouble. Wow. Went on to be the uh, what is today the, the most highly decorated graduate of the Citadel. And when he after, after he got out of the military, he he made general. And then after he got out of the military, he became the commandant of the cadets of the Citadel. But he was he was a mean, tough son of a bitch. <laughs> His, his daughter, who was Nancy Mace, the politician, either your favorite or, or, your, or your declared enemy, depending on your politics. <laughs> I'm, I'm very conflicted. I'm a, I'm a Democrat, and I don't like her politics, but I love the person. I'm befuddled by why she is the way she is, but she, I think she's, she's imitating her father. Well, she tells a story about her dad in his first tour of Vietnam. He was a, in, in, an advisor for the Arvin, the Vietnamese forces. And they were doing a, some operation in, in the rice paddies. And they were in, at a particular position in the mud. And they pulled back to another position. And this guy's name is James Mace, Captain Mace, not General Mace. Realized that he had dropped his citadel ring. It had fallen off his hand because he, he lost so much weight. And he, it was not okay with him. And so he went to his, his com commander, probably a captain, and said, I got to go back and get my ring. And the guy said, okay. So he goes back to get his ring and on his way, he runs into a couple of bad guys and shoots them dead. I'm not telling you the story is true. I'm just telling you this is the story that his daughter tells. Yes, sir. And then he gets that back to where he was and he starts feeling around in the mud, finally finds his ring, puts it on, comes back, runs into another bad guy, shoots him dead, and rejoins his, his, his unit. This is a guy who used to uh, wrestle, he's from South Carolina, he used to used to wrestle alligators for sport when he was a young man. Wow. So he was our boss for six or seven months of the time that I was there. Well, and what made him a tough son of a bitch? What made him such a hard-nosed commander? I don't know, you know, and I've gotten to know the guy a little bit because of the reunions. And we're very fond of each other. I have photographs of him smiling, this very sweet smile at me. Um, and I know that he, th he thinks well of how I served him as, a, as an RTO. But um, I, I don't know what his upbringing was. His kids are all strack. Several of the military, so several of the military academy. His daughter's tougher than nails, and and is nothing but a troublemaker in the House of Representatives. <laughs> and doesn't think twice about it. Now was so he I, like I, that? I, I, was he like that in country too? Tough as nails and nothing but a troublemaker in terms when it came to finding the enemy? I don't know what she was like other than we had a reunion in, in at, at the Citadel's campus. And I took my kids who were oh, I don't know. 10 and 12, maybe. And my daughter was, the, the younger one, 
and, and having some personality issues, some struggles. And there was Nancy Mace and Nancy Mace offered out of the blue to take my daughter on a, on a personal tour of the Citadel. And she did, she showed her the room that she lived in and the parade grounds and told her all the stuff and had written a book called In the Company of Men about how she, Nancy Mace, was, was the first female graduate from the Citadel. So she was sort of famous already. And she just took my daughter in, in hand and under, under her wing and kept her for the, half a day. And my daughter was changed forever. She got a taste of what it was like to have a, a, a strong self-image and, and, and a healthy ego. Well, and, and she remembers Nancy very fondly. So I remember Nancy very fondly. And I had dinner with her a couple of times, just for my wife and me. But as I say, I don't, I don't love her political tactics and I don't love her politics, but I will go to my grave grateful to her for how kind she was to my daughter. Wow. Well, I mean, I think that's an incredible message for our time. But, you know, speaking of Miss Mace, here's her dad right here, a photograph you took in country. That's right. Now, if I'm not mistaken, just looking at some gear here, we've got a, a, a map in the corner, but we've that's a car 15, correct? I think that's I think that's what he carried. Now, as his RTO, you are in his hip pocket at all times, no matter when and where. With one exception, yes. And when it comes to the radio communications, are you the ones doing the majority of the talking, or does he grab the horn from you and does he start communicating with the rest of the platoons and then whatnot? How what's that process? I don't remember really clearly, but I think I did a lot of the talking. I know that I carried maps with me, and I know that we used to joke that because I, I had I had I had to decode messages, and it was too hot to decode paper. We didn't have waterproof paper like you have in scuba diving research. You're doing underwater research. You have slates, clipboards with with underwater paper, but we didn't have that. So I used my leg as my notepad. It was a ball pen um, pen. Um, writes very nicely on, on the, the cloth that the fatigues were made out of. And the joke was that the, the, the bad guys, if they knew what they were doing, didn't wouldn't want to kill me. They'd want to capture me and steal my <laughs> steal my pants. So if if I was if I was decoding uh, messages from primarily objective locations, I must have been doing a lot of the talking. Well, I'm curious. I've talked to a, a couple of Marine RTOs, and they've never mentioned decoding, but you have. So, what kind of messages would you decode, and how would you go about that process? I, I had I had the the code book, code book with me, and I would write down what the what the uh, message was that I got sent, and then I take out the code book and I would decode it, and I would but I use my pants as my my tablet, and I think it was primarily locations that we were supposed to march to. Well, and. Through those objectives as well, I mean, when you reach an uh, objective or certain checkpoints, would you radio to the other platoons or would someone else radio that you've reached the objectives? Who does the communication in that regard? Well, somebody's walking point and that person belongs to a platoon and different platoons would, would be first in the order of march. So if the first platoon is the Marseille have a point guy, <laughs> maybe a compass guy behind him, then back a little bit in, in the order of march would be the platoon leader, the, the lieutenant, and, and his radio operator. And he would be in constant verbal contact with the point guy. And he would report back to the CO, whatever was important to report back to the CO.
now with that too, when you would stop on patrol and let's say that um, you're going to dig dig night positions in itself, who would be in the CP hole? I know, you know, your company commander would be, you would be, would any of the, would the first sergeant be there? Would you have medical personnel there? Not in the hole, but in the, when we stop for the night, we would always circle up into a forward operating base, a fob. We would create a fob. And if there were trees around, I would blow the trees so that we had a chimney for the helicopter to come down for with resupply. And then around the perimeter, we would cut brush, we could all carry machetes. We would cut brush out a ways. And then at the edge of the brush, we would put claymore mines and white phosphorus trip flares. And then you come back across the, the cleared area and, and there would be uh, all fighting holes there. And then in the center would be the CP. And the CP would we'd have the command commander, the two radio operators, a logistics supply guy and the artillery uh, forward observer. And we would make up the CP. Now, if I'm not mistaken, the artillery forward observer that you mentioned was um, uh, Phillips, last name Phillips? No, Smith. Smith. Paul My Smith. apologies. Paul Smith, that's it. I knew there was a piece somewhere. Now, you held Paul Smith in pretty high regard, if I'm not mistaken. And due to this day. Now, we're, as we're, in, good, we're good friends. So I, I don't like his politics either, but <laughs> I, I love the man. Well, and as an artillery FO, um, from what I've gathered from the photographs and, of course, the stories, he was pretty damn good at his job calling in fire missions. He and his sergeant, who was his number two, were both rack shots. So we're bringing up a picture of Paul here, and Paul's looking at a map. That's Paul there, correct? Correct. Do you, who's this redheaded man back here? Don't know. Anybody else you recognize in the picture? No, I've, I've blanked out a lot of it. I didn't have a lot of friends because I was always close to the lieutenant or the captain. And most of the time I was there, I was, I was with the, the COCP. So I, I remember the people in the CP, but I don't remember a lot of people out in, in the other platoons. Well, speaking of Paul Smith as an RDFO, uh, I assume he called in 105s, 155s occasionally. Were there Airplanes. ever any... Airplanes too? Yeah. Not not very often. But also sometimes naval bombardment. Wow. So anywhere you operated, did you always have a ring of artillery that you that he could call in if necessary? With with one exception, which is the story that you read about the antennas when we went in to take out and take away this um Divisional NVA Divisional Forward Supply Base and discovered that we had no comms. So that, that had a fairly high pucker factor associated with it. I'm sure. I mean, and with that, I mean, with no comms, the only supporting arms that you can utilize in the field would be the battalion mortars and company 60 millimeters, right? Well, we couldn't we couldn't talk to the battalion. What? Wow. So just 60 millimeters too. That's it. And until you run out of, of ammunition. That's definitely a pretty intense pucker factor. It was, it was scary. So if I can ask, as you were an RTO, what happened with the communication issues? Was it a distance of terrain or frequency change? What went wrong? I don't know. We just we just said that the ground sucked up the radio waves. We didn't we didn't know, but as my my story pointed out, I happened to have with me some. I I, I had been feeling I wasn't getting enough adrenaline, and I was considering joining the LERPs, the Long Range Reconnaissance Patrol guys, because they had an even scarier job than I had. Fortunately, I came to my senses and didn't. <laughs> But as I was getting to know these guys, 
they taught me how to make field expedient antennas that are cut to the frequencies that, are, that we use. So they're more efficient than just the mast. And, and the, the, the way to use them is to get them up in the trees. So after we knocked on the front door of this poor um, NBA base, for a supply base, we went off to the side of, of, of the, the, the place and created a circle, cut a, cut a chute, a chimney for the helicopter to come down, set out the, the claymores and the trip flares. And I set out to, to deploy these, these masts, I mean, I mean these, these antennas. And so what I, what I needed was a, a long stick, which was plenty of supply. Little sticks to, because the, the masks were pyramid shaped, but sticks across the bottom, you know, attached to a, a point on top. And then they ran wires up to the mast and then they then tied, tied off of up there and then they came down to the ground. And then I had to put another wire on the mast and get it over a, a limb on the tree so I could get it up in the air. And there was a tree that was, it was bare of limbs up to about 100 feet. And then there was this beautiful limb just waiting there. And I got the uh, Vietnamese Chu Hoi, Sergeant Khan, to go skinnying up the, <laughs> the, the, the tree with the end of the, the lanyard in his teeth. He got halfway up and the bad guy saw him and started shooting at him and the world opened up on him. Never seen anybody climb down a tree so fast in your life. <laughs> so we put out some suppressing fire and they, they finally decided to put their heads down. And he got up to the, the ranch at a hundred feet, put the wire over the over the branch and ran it, brought it back down. We, we hauled the, the rig up so the antennas were, were now at 100 feet off the ground, cut to our frequency. But the conventional frequencies that we were supposed to use didn't still didn't work. And so I spent the, that night not sleeping, but, but going through every frequency that the PRIC-25 would, would do within the ranges that I knew some of it may, might possibly be operating. And I would... I would say niner, 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 which means anybody, anybody, anybody. This is Apache 6 India. That was my call sign. Does anybody copy? If you copy, please respond. Over. Nothing. Click to the next frequency. Niner, 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 this is Apache 6 India. Does anybody copy? In silence. Click. Finally, I got a guy. And it was a helicopter. It was just sort of in the area. And explained our situation and he stuck around and relayed information orally until we got another helicopter to come in and just fly circles over over his way the hell up so he couldn't be shot and he had a relay so whatever i transmitted got automatically retransmitted to the to our battalion headquarters so now we had artillery and now we had resupply and then the next morning, they got an airplane to fly circles. And so we had airplanes flying circles over our heads for three and a half days. Well, and in that fight, too, especially when you were trying to raise battalion, if I'm not mistaken, there was definitely a need of at least a resupply at that point, correct? Yeah, well, I got them during the middle of the night, and so the resupply arrived. Now... Through that at night, if I may ask, knowing that there's NVA out there, how does a Huey approach um, a temporary FOB at night? With Do they come in sling loading or do they try to come in and sit down in a cleared area? We cleared a big area for them and they, and they came and sat down and, and they didn't come down at night. They came down with one exception. They, they came down during the daylight. And they, they wouldn't be down on, on the ground for very long because that, that was part of our drill. Was that you get it down, and the helicopter touches down, and then you got to you got to have them cleared out in fifteen seconds. That way, they can't bring mortars or anything like that in on the helicopter. They they can, but they just got to get them off real fast. Yes, sir. 
and I imagine we had the tubes with us. We just needed the ammo, and we needed water, and we needed food. But the Huey's not very big. It doesn't take that that long, to, even with with the seats out. It doesn't take that long to to offload it. So, these helicopters would come down. In the end of the second or third day, I forget which helicopter comes down. Bad guys see it. It's dusk. It's the last the last sortie of the night. Bad guys see it. They start shooting at it. There's a red tracers. It's ours. Green tracers is theirs because they got some of our weapons. The helicopter lost control, left its tail rotor about a hundred feet up in a tree like a hawk, like a tomahawk, came thumping down to the ground, landed on a willy peat, a white phosphorus trip flare. Somebody ran out and extinguished the trip flare, which we knew how to do by hitting it with a, a shovel. We could stop, we could stop it from continuing to burn. The guy I was on the phone with a little bit ago, the last time we talked, reminded me that there was a fire besides the Willie Pete. But I don't remember. And the uh, one of the one of the crew broke his leg. But it was too bad because they weren't flying anymore that day. So he spent the night with us and we cut another chimney and got him out the next day. Well, and through that fight too, I mean, this was a multi-day fight. And was Alpha Company the only company engaged in this or was this a battalion operation? Two companies went in, Alpha and Charlie. Our our boss, General Mace, Captain Mace, then was was the senior officer, so he was controlling it. Once once we took possession of it, which we did by we we, we knocked on the front door, and were repulsed. We knocked on the back door, and were repulsed. Lost a bunch of men. We we weren't going to win, so we went back out to the same landing zone. That. Uh, we came in on you have a photograph of that landing zone. Yeah, that picture, I think I've actually got it right here. Um, let me pull that up for it real quick. This one, this picture right here. Yeah, that's the landing zone that we went into, in through and out of. So we went back out of that landing zone and I was the last guy on the ground. I was so scared I could, could hardly keep from peeing in my pants. <laughs> But the CEO and I were the last people off, and he happened to jump in the helicopter a moment before I did. But anyway, we went out and ended up, got taken to a Michelin plantation. And we were nine-tenths of a kilometer away from the, the place that we were trying to take over. And the standoff, the approved standoff distance is... A, a kilometer, you know, we, we brought the B-52s in, or an arc light, and we could feel the ground rumble as their bombs hit. So then we walked back in, found bloody bandages. I think we saw one guy running away. And we started offloading. We, we, we cut some more holes and started offloading all the, uh, I don't, you don't have a picture of the, I, I can't get to it fast enough. I, I have a picture of the loot. I don't think I've got a picture of the loot, no, sir. No, because what you have is, is was photographs that I took. And I can't remember right now where the picture of the loot is. But anyway, we got, we were offloading the loot to the rear to take it away from the bad guys, and they brought D Company, and I think it was, I think it was Delta Company, and they were not a real good organization, so we we put them in the circle of the fob, and they had responsibility for shooting off mortars and dropping them right outside of our perimeter. 
So if somebody was sneaking up on us, they would just know that we, we could shoot them. And they would say they were green, hadn't seen a lot of combat, and they fired off a short round. And you can tell it's a short round because of a, a muffled explosion instead of a sharp explosion. But they didn't call it as it was leaving the tube. They called it when it was up at the, at the top of its apogee. And mortars blow up and out when, when they land. So because it was a short round, it landed inside of our circle. And because it had been called late, guys were still up and running to safe holes. So they were standing up, and so 13 guys got taken out by these mortars that our guys fired. I don't think there were any deaths, but there were 13 wounded. Jeez. The, the rest of the night offloading them. Well, I mean, this fight in itself, too, I mean, it's, if I'm not mistaken, this was the fight that Captain Mace was awarded his DSC, correct? Affirmative. And as the RTO, I mean, you were there for his actions during that fight in itself. You were right alongside with him. Except for when they went and knocked on the door the second time, because he had me stay back and, and man the, the repeater, make sure that we could keep communications. And the second platoon RTO, which is the job I had had, went out with General Mace, Captain Mace, and got hit. He was holding his weapon across his chest, and a bullet came and took his middle finger off and went into his stomach. It was Jim Wallace, Jim Walker. And I've been looking for Jim. I heard that he, I want to apologize to him because it was the bullet had my name on it. It was meant for him. Me, it wasn't meant for him. But just because of the fluke of Mace telling me to stay back, he got it. And I heard that he retired from Chicago Transit, but I've never been able to fire, find him. But, but the rest of the time I was with Mace. Well, with... Jim Walker getting the hit and, as you say, taking the bullet that was for you, Did have you struggled with some guilt from that in itself, especially after the war? Not guilt, but sorrow. Sorrow? I mean, it was meant for me. I mean, it wasn't meant for me, not in, not in real life, but the way I processed it, it was meant for me, and, I, and I'm sorry I wasn't there to pull my end of the, of the war. Well, and a lot of people, especially a lot of you Vietnam vets, Marine and Army grunts, would share the same sentiment you just did because the brotherhood that's created. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's aberrant in any way. I just, it's just that's how I feel. Well, I mean, and through this uh, series of operations, I mean. Alpha and uh, Alpha Company as well. I think, I, if I'm not mistaken, was Bravo involved in this operation at all? You know, I don't remember if Bravo was or, or not. There was, there was Alpha and Charlie and then a third one, and it could have been Bravo, it could have been Delta, and I don't remember. Well, in, in this operation, uh, going in and destroying, of course, the bunker complexes in itself, I mean... At Alpha Company, of course, as you mentioned, you know, you took 35% casualties in that self. I mean, that's a pretty heavy three-day fight in a short period, especially one that runs into the night. Yes. And I mean, so... All I got to say is you're, you're absolutely right. It was not, didn't have any of the fame of I Drang, but it was this, behind I Drang, it was apparently the second largest force on first fight of the war. And it was a beast. 
Well, and as a combat vet yourself, I mean, you're right there on the front lines. What's it like from your perspective? I mean, truthfully, what are the sounds? How scary is that from your point of view as an RTO? I've suppressed almost all of it. I can't remember. What I remember, the part, I, I remember parts. I don't think I felt fear. I felt rage. On on the walkout when we got in, in the second fight of the week, I remember that I was pinned down behind a, a fallen tree, and I and I I wore two canteens in my back and two canteens in my front, and my butt was sticking up because of the two canteens in my front, and I wanted to undo the the belt so I could get them out of the way and get my butt down a couple of inches lower, but I couldn't do it without raising my butt up. And I I thought the, at the moment it was a pretty funny set of circumstances. But I, I was married to my first wife at the time, and I remember saying to her, I'm not going to let him, I owe you coming to, I owe you coming home alive. I'm not going to let him kill me. God damn it, I'm not going to let him kill me. So I, I remember those feelings. The other feelings I remember is just, just having to do my job. I had to get the comms rigged, and I, and I did. I had to blow the chimney, I did. Well, speaking of the comms, if I'm not mistaken, uh, I think there's a photograph in the collection of that, uh, of a similar setup of the field comms, correct? The, the, the very same ones. Yeah, let me pull that up for us. I mean, and through that job, I mean, if you were aren't able to establish communications, there's a very good chance Alpha Company could have been in a hell of a lot worse situation than it ended up in. Affirmative. And, you know... A lot of people would look at this and be like, well, John, what the hell are we looking at here? Well, you, you see the the three triangles. Yep. And the wires that go up into the sky and the three triangles form a pyramid. Yeah, and I see your I see your mouse go up a little bit to a You follow the squiggly line up? Yep. There's two squiggly lines, one on the right, one on the left? Yep. That's the wire that's connected to. Wow. All right, there we go. There we go. So back from our technical difficulty. Um, so it brings up a question I have, John. Looking at the photograph, did the NVA try to bring this contraption down at any point with sustained fire? Well, crap. Well, retrying this a second time. <laughs> John, did the NVA try to bring down the contraption that you had set up with the radios to communicate? Did they realize what that was? I don't remember they trying to do it. It, it wasn't. It was not conspicuous visually, but mostly I just don't remember. Well, it, do you remember how many casualties in total Alpha Company took in that three-day fight? All right. Try number three. So in the three-day fight, John, um, I don't know if you heard the question, but I was curious. Do you recall the total numbers for the casualties of Alpha Company in that operation? No, I don't. It was a lot. Now, with that fight, too, I mean, there's medevac birds, I assume, coming in, bringing the wounded out, of course, bringing in supplies in itself. And overall, was the operation seen as a success? Yeah, we took away the largest ammunition cache of the war. Wow. How now how do you recall how many tons of ammo and artillery rounds were found? No, but we had Chinooks flying in and loading up the Chinooks and it took several days. Wow. It, it was a lot of stuff. I mean, that's 
pretty damn impressive. And did that warrant any kind of presidential unit citation or anything from the battalion? No, it, it got me a big medal. And there was some talk about giving me a bronze star for valor, but that never happened. Now, giving you a bronze star, if I may ask for what, sir? Well, for getting the the, uh, the antennas rig. I mean, that's I, definitely... I got, I got a bronze star for military service, and I don't even remember what I did for that. Well, I mean, even if thinking about it, a lot of people associate Valor medals for being involved in the actual killing or taking of a position, but stringing up antenna wires under fire to get in comms with the battalion, that's a, definitely a valorous effort. I mean, it's an important job, a necessary job. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of famous within the... Well, actually, my antennas are famous within the reunion group. Mace, Mace will say something nice about him and everybody go, yeah, Winnie's antennas. <laughs> Thank you, Winnie. Now, was that the only time in your tour that you had to jerry-rig some antennas, or did that happen frequently? No, most of the time we had we had comms. Well, all thanks to your lurk pals that you had made friends with. Yeah, no lie. <laughs> so, following... The fight in itself here in December, did Alpha Company get a few days respite or did you just go back out into the field on patrols and operations? They they went back out. I I rolled out to go to uh, Hawaii for my R and R. And some months before I had been on an airplane landing somewhere, probably Fukuin. And I was one of the last guys on the airplane. So I was at the back of the airplane. And so the airplane lands and it's hotter and stinking. So they drop the tailgate down to horizontal. So I'm standing on this tailgate, hanging onto one of the hydraulic struts. And I look out the back and I see this little building that serves as the, as the airport. And there are these brown puffs of smoke popping up on the other side of them, everybody's running a million different directions. And I realized that the sons of bitches were mortaring the airport. <laughs> I'm, on the, I'm, on, I'm on the tailgate of this airplane. It's at the end of the runway, turning around really slow, making a prime target, making yourself a prime target. And I'm just going, my number is up, brother. And so I got whoever I was, and I started talking real fast. And I got, I can type. I got a college degree. And so I got assigned to the rear, to the to battalion. And so I we finished the fight. A week or so later, I'm I'm in. Yeah, a week, week or so there because I arrived in in Honolulu for my R and R and meet my first wife there on uh, New Year's Eve. And in Honolulu, New Year's Eve, there's nothing but firecrackers. And I just come out of this three and a half day firefight. So I spent most of the time under the bed in the in the hotel, my, my poor then wife. I wasn't like that at all when I the last time I saw her I, eight months prior. But anyway, did R and R, came home, came back to Vietnam. Ended up as a, as a personnel clerk at battalion. And right before I, I came home, the guys hit another big fight with another lot of casualties, but I wasn't there and, and I felt really bad about that. But I also hated being in the rear in general because it was all complicated with relationships and and strap hanger lieutenants that I didn't I didn't um, respect giving me a lot of shit about my lack of military decorum. We were trying to figure out who was dead and who was wounded on on, on the various rosters one one night and I was wearing a pants of 
robin's egg blue shorts that I just found somewhere that were that were cooler than the long pants. No shirt. I'm having a conversation with these lieutenants with a pen in my mouth. And the lieutenant knocks the pen out of my mouth, calls me to attention, and gives me a bunch of crap for being out on uniform. And I just it was just fuming inside. Because he didn't, he had not been outside of the barbed wire ever in his life. So I didn't like being in the rear for that reason. And the second reason I didn't like being in the rear is that when we got mortared, our response was to be <coughs> running, get in some bunkers, like a bunch of scared rats. And I was used to shooting back. So I felt really helpless. But I didn't get hurt. And I conned them out of, out of a uh, leave to go to Bangkok. So I got away from the job for a week, went, went to Bangkok and had a lovely time. Ran into the, the wife of a guy I had been in, in military school with. She showed me the town. He was up in Chiang Mai. And I think he made it back for the last couple of days. But anyway, it was nice seeing them. I sing Bangkok. And then I came home. Well, I mean, through that, I want to... Oh, oh, I, I didn't go home I, before. I also figured out how to read the regs and make myself a sergeant. Oh, how'd you do that? I just read the regs. Put, put myself in for sergeant. Got somebody that's got the right people to sign the right thing. So two days before I came home, I made sergeant. <laughs> And I wanted to be sergeant really bad because what the gossip was that if if you were sergeant, you didn't have to do KP when the reserves came and got you. And I, and I was tired of doing KP. I didn't want to go back to that. <laughs> so I made myself sergeant, got home, and the reserves never called. But my, I got to wear a shirt that says sergeant went with it. Even though I was a sergeant for about three days. Nothing wrong with that. I mean, no. it... It's valid on the shirt. I see it right there. Yeah. Well, even taking all of this, going back to being in the rear, would would anyone say anything to these lieutenants that had never been out in the field for those that had? I mean, how do you not there's, speak there's back? No, my, my, my contempt, I'm sure, was clear and obvious. It's one, of the, one of the hard parts about warfighters for me is that World Fighters is open to anybody who's a veteran without regard to gender, branch of service, job, rating, doesn't matter. But there is a, a, a silent club of those of us who've been shot at. And I, I say, I've said for years and it's true to this day that I am the only time that I am completely comfortable talking to somebody is when I'm talking to somebody who can tell the difference between the sound of a bullet coming at you and the sound of a bullet going wide. If you've had that experience and you, and you know the difference, then you're my friend and I can talk to you about anything. So those of us who are in the rear who have been in, uh, in combat, we're not too secretly contemptuous of those who had stayed in the rear. And if I'm not mistaken, a lot of those in the rear, they were lifers trying to advance their careers in itself, go further within the army, but they had never been out in the shit. I don't, I don't know about that. I think they were more in, in yeah, no, that's, that's, that's true. The guy who made me block point, as soon as the, the CO got out of, got out of, got rotated back to the rear, the sergeant went and sucked up to the guy and got an assignment in the rear. But there is a certain logic to it. I, I'm, I'm not contemptuous of them for doing that at all. I'm just contemptuous if they don't pay attention to the fact that I did something that they didn't do. Understandably so. But getting out of the woods was a, a, a very understandable sentiment. Well, 
even that, but going back to that first R and R with your first wife and that New Year's Eve, did she understand or try to assist you with the firecrackers and you being under the bed? Did she make any connection to that? I don't remember. What I remember is when I came home, she was the only person in my entire universe who was interested in in nurturing at all. And then Daniel killed her. She threw her arms around me to give me a loving hug from behind. And I cocked and went back like that at her neck and stopped about an inch from her neck. She did not deserve that. I scared the crap out of her. But I scared the crap out of my current wife because of doing something like that too. So it didn't go away. Well, even when you de-rose and come back to the world, come back to the United States, did you, what was the adjustment period like of realizing that, you know, you had been in combat in Vietnam, you know, four or five months ago. Now you're just back in the United States. It wasn't four or five months. I guess it was four months. Um, I just, I just blotted it out. I went to New York, picked up my, my then wife and, and our Volkswagen bus that we had bought with the money for the, the got in the wedding reception nine months prior. Drove out to Los Angeles, found an apartment. I moved in with my sister for a week or so. And I found an apartment and I went to grad school. I'd, I'd gotten out of the army a month and a half early to go, to, go back to grad school. And so I took my bicycle and rode it up from where I, I lived in corner of Santa Monica Boulevard and Veteran Avenue, which I thought was kind of funny. <laughs> I drove, rode my bicycle up to UCLA and went to, went to grad school and became a teaching assistant and had to, and I was majoring in television I wanted to major in film but my ex-wife checked the wrong box so I was teaching kids how to do television production which is what my undergrad degree was in and they were whining and complaining about I don't want to be second camera. I don't want to do sound. I don't want to be the stage manager. I want to do something else. And I just, all I could do was just bite my teeth, bite my tongue and grip my teeth. And then one of them wasn't that way. And I inquired who he was. His name was Craig Anderson. It turns out he had lost his brother who was a Marine helicopter pilot in Vietnam. Craig and I ended up going to see the wall right after it was built. And been a lifelong friend since. That's incredible. Well, speaking of the wall, John, as a Vietnam veteran, when it was built, you've been to the wall. What was your first impression of the wall? Well, I had, I had read about the controversy. I thought the wall was terrific, and I still think the wall is terrific. And I cry every time I go there. And my friend Craig and I cried when we went there the first time for either one of us. It's a, it's a stunning memorial to me. It's, I mean, it's very moving. I mean, if anyone who's ever interested in Vietnam reads about 2-5 or any other unit, and, and if you get invested into it, you eventually come across names that you can find on the wall and being able to make that connection, even for regular people, that's still a connection to the legacy of the Vietnam War. I think there's a picture in the book of the wall and a finger pointing at Refugio Canales, who died in my friend Tom Banda's arms as I was trying to yell to talk a uh, convince a medevac helicopter pilot to uh, to land and take care of Cookie. But he wouldn't do it because it was, he had heard it was a, a hot, a red landing zone. And it was explained to him the only people who had shot were us. There were no bad guys around. But the, uh, the guy wouldn't land and Cookie died. And then Tom went to warfighters. And that's probably when that picture was taken. 
Oh, the guys went from more fighters, and we looked at other people's names too. Well, even then, I mean, I know for myself when I go to the wall with interviewing Vietnam veterans, uh, just like you did, I, I get told about names, guys who are no longer with us. And being able for me to go back to the wall, find their name and be able to carry on that legacy to tell that story. I mean, for me as a historian, it, it's a big deal for me. I mean, because it's not just a name on a wall. That person had a a life they had a story they had a family perhaps loved ones and their story needs to be known it's not just the name there's more to it than just a name yeah i was talking with my friend before i talked to you one of his complaints is that nobody but nobody in, in the world who hasn't been exposed to it cna I was going to show you a picture of Ricky Canales, but I can't get it to come up on my, on my phone. Anyway, he, he was complaining that, that nobody gets what war is really all about, and, and and I was telling him how much I agree with him. It's, it's not the war that the get it you see in the Brad Pitt movies. The only movie that got close was you, we were soldiers. Um, and I think that that's true about the the death of the, of the people who died. On one hand, is is I'm I'm pleased and gratified that people like you want to tell the story. On the other hand, it's kind of irrelevant. They're dead. They died in an unjust cause. They died protecting their brothers and sisters. Not not trying to keep America safe because America's safety had nothing to do with the Vietnam War. Um. They they were they, they gave their lives they 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 put on the, the colors of their country which and said the oath which was in great part agreeing that I will give my life if that's what it takes and they delivered on the on that promise they were noble in that respect they weren't necessarily heroic some of them just at the wrong place at the wrong time some of them were heroic. But I'm, I'm glad that guys like you feel that you need to tell the story. I, I just, I don't. They're dead. Piece of me died with them. For you, I mean, even now, speaking in this regard, I mean, do, do you ever get those pieces back? Do you ever try to bring healing to the soul? How do you do that? No, it's impossible. You can't, you can't. You can't let go of it. You can you can get into a community like war fighters, like our reunions, like my weekly phone call with Rich Sherwood, my occasional phone call with with Raul Hernandez, my occasional phone call with Tom Banda, my occasional email with Paul Smith. And that that helps. You can try and get oneself straight about the essence of what really happened and and what and what one did. But I don't think, and 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 the experts in trauma and therapy agree with this. I don't think it's ever going to go away. I think I'm still going to tear up when I talk about it. But the only the only thing the only thing that's close to to a, a respite is when I get together with the guys 
we did it because we understand it. And so a lot of the bad parts of it are in how it relates to the outside world. The people's lack of understanding about where the people lack of understanding about what I did, people not caring about what I did, people not understanding the psychological impact of, of war, the emotional impact of war. That's all gone away when, when a group of vets get, gets together. I'm involved in a in a in a Parkinson's uh, support group at the Long Beach VA, and so at least twice a month, I'm in the presence of other vets, and that helps. But it's folly to think that it's going really to go away. Well, speaking of those of you from Alpha, the second and the fifth calf, how often do you guys get together? Rich and I talk weekly. I've, I've sort of pulled back the Parkinson's and shrank my world. And I'm just sort of coming out of it. But I'm finding that I'm... <coughs> it's harder for me to talk to people than it used to be. People I don't, I don't have a complete agreement with. So we don't do reunions anymore because we're all too old. So I just hang on to the parts I can hang on to. Well, through the, all of that, I mean, and even bringing this back together, John, I just can't thank you enough for being willing to talk with me and share your story with me. Thanks for listening, little brother. Hey, I mean, it's what I'm here for. I mean, I want to try to carry on the legacy that I can and educate some people about what happened in a place 50 years ago. So maybe we can learn from it. Well, I hope your students do. Well, they've enjoyed it. Uh, I mean, and I know other people have too through this. And so whenever you've got some more free time in the next couple of weeks, I'm ready to get down for another one and continue talking about what happens to you in college and where our career takes us. I will, I will respond to you positively whenever you Suggest whatever you suggest. Well, thanks, John. And if there's anything else that I've left out in this so far, we can always revisit it. And so, as always, my friend, uh, thanks for your service and welcome home. Thank you so much. I look forward to talking to you next time. Thank you. You enjoy your day out there, all right? You as well. Stay dry. Thanks. I will. See you, John. Bye.